Thank you for that, Natasha and Ariel. It's always a blessing to have friends um, and fellow youth come up and share a special item for us. Um, I'd like to just say good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone here. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Uh, thank you for, all for coming today and for my friends who are here supporting me. Um, but I will admit it's a bit weird being up here, not for announcements or worship leader duties or anything to do with the youth, but actually to share something with you um, from the Bible. Um, but Pastor Victor told me that it would be good to get up here and share with you, um, with the congregation. So I agreed and it's definitely a pleasure to be here um, and to be given this opportunity. I will admit until yesterday I had a slightly different sermon um, but yesterday when I was reading over it, fine-tuning it, um, I felt that uh, it needed to be changed. So I apologise in advance, but it's going to be a bit shorter than normal. Um, but please bear with me and I just, um, I hope that we can all um, learn something. So before I begin, um, I'm just going to pray and I'd like to thank Erica for that beautiful prayer earlier as well and for praying for me, it um, really touched me. And for all of you who have been praying for me as well, um, it's Comforting to know that we have such a great community here, um, willing to support me and the youth and everyone else as well. Um, so I'm just going to pray that God speaks through me and that we as a congregation learn something more about our faith and about our God. So if you'd bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we come before you here today on another day of worship for you, God, on another Sabbath day, another blessed day. Um, I just pray that you fill my heart with the Holy Spirit and that you speak through me so that I can share the good news and the gospel and your word with the congregation here before me. I just pray that you open all of our hearts and all of our minds so that we may hear what you want me to speak. Speak through me, Lord. Um, I know that you're already in the process of doing that because I felt cold yesterday to change my sermon. Um, just be with us today and be with me, uh, calm my nerves, and um, please uh, speak your word through me. In your loving name I pray, amen. <laughs> so before I start, I just want to um, quickly share an illustration with you all. Um, it's about a man and he's trying to grow some plants in his garden, um, some flowers and some small vegetables so that he can sustain himself. Um, he's picked up this hobby and he just wants to start cultivating the earth. He works hard outside and he tends to his garden. He makes sure um, that he's doing his best that he can in his garden with his vegetable patch and flowers. But the flowers just aren't taking very well. Um, and the vegetables, when they do grow, they grow very small and not very many of them grow. He continues to work the ground and tries his best to create what he thinks is the right environment for his plants. But they just don't seem to be growing all that well. One day, this man comes across a book on gardening and he decides to buy it. When he reads it, he notices that it mentions greenhouses being good for creating environments for plant growth. Finding a cheap greenhouse, he buys it and decides to give it a go. He spends his time reading the book and learning about what needs to be done to grow plants, and he constructs the greenhouse in his backyard, moving all of his flowers and all of his crops into this greenhouse in the new building in his backyard. He spends time tending to his garden, and um, based on the, what he read from the book, he decides that he's going to start pulling all the weeds, he's going to make sure that all of the nasty bugs are taken out, um, he's going, he starts making sure that the plants have enough water, enough sunlight, and he goes out and buys fertilizer. When it com comes time again in the springtime for his crops to be harvested and his plants to grow, he notices that the flowers are standing taller, like the flowers that we have here in this beautiful church, and that his vegetables are larger, the plentiful, much more delicious looking than they were before. The gardener realised that what he ended up doing was creating an optimal environment for his plants to grow by putting them in the greenhouse, by giving them the, the right amount of water and fertiliser and checking the soil as well. It was just the right combination of everything working together to increase the harvest. So growing and developing our faith, I believe, is very similar to this. 
We need to create an environment that helps us continually feed our faith. It's important to also think of this when we are sharing our faith with others. It's easy to just blab all of the good news in the Bible to someone because we're so excited about what it means for us and we just hope that they're going to understand it. But most of the time, it isn't beneficial to them or us if we just rifle off everything that we know. We need to cre remember to create an optimal greenhouse environment for the seeds of faith in our hearts to grow and blossom, just like the man in the illustration. So what creates the optimal environment for seeds of faith to grow? I touched on this a little bit in the illustration that I shared earlier, um, but I've tried to sort out the different aspects of plant growing and have identified four main areas that are important to growing anything. Um, these four aspects apply to almost all environments, I think, um, where something is growing, and I'm going to try and show you how it can apply to our lives and our seeds of faith. The first one I've identified is the soil. The soil a seed is planted in is extremely important. This foundation is where the seed is going to dwell and grow its roots and eventually blossom out from. In Matthew 13, in the parable of the sower, which is also known as the parable of the four types of soil, Jesus identifies this importance of the soil. Um, I hope we're all familiar with the parable um, so I'm just going to quickly read Jesus' explanation right at the end of that passage um, where he explains to his disciples what each of the soil means. So if you'd like to read with me, it's in Matthew 13, um, starting from verse 18. Actually, do we have a volunteer who wants to read this for me? Anybody? All right, Ariel will do it. Verses um, 18 to 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means when anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand. The evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word once received it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Thank you, Ariel. So here, Jesus explains the four types of soil. The path, which is a person who hears the word but does not take anything to heart. They don't want to believe. They don't want to let that seed of faith sit in their heart. Then there is the rocky ground, which is a person who receives the good news with joy, but it takes no root in their heart and they flee after tough times or persecution. When things get too hard, they abandon their faith. The third is the thir thorny or full of weeds ground, where the person hears the word, but allows fear and sin to pull them away and choke out their faith. The fourth and final is the good soil, which is a person's heart that is ready to hear and able to understand the word of God. Before we can even begin to start growing our seed of faith, we need to ensure that our hearts have been cultivated with the right soil. Our hearts and minds need to be open and ready to accept Christ and the good news. We need to constantly be searching for more in our faith. And when we're helping someone else grow their faith, we need to help them prepare their hearts and get their soil ready for the seed of faith to be planted. However, sometimes this isn't something that we can necessarily do ourselves. Sometimes it happens because of the circumstances around a person. But thankfully, God knows when a heart is ready for him to enter. This, um, number one, soil, a willing and ready heart, is checkbox number one. 
So number two is sunlight and water. Um, sunlight and water are two very necessary things for almost anything to live, not only just for a plant to grow. Both are important in the development of the seed because they both give life to the plant. Um, when I was thinking about this point, I decided that I would cheat a little bit and use the sun, S-U-N, as a direct correlation to the sun, S-O-N, because there's absolutely no doubt that in order to continue to grow in our faith, we need guidance from Christ the Son and his examples on how to live a Christian life. Christ brings light into our lives, much like the natural sun, and he is able to help us identify areas that we need to work on and grow as a Christian. But his light is also of love, and that love is what helps sustain us as we go about our lives. If we truly believe that Christ sacrificed his life for us, then that is such a redeeming and fulfilling part of our faith. Through his guidance, we can actually learn so much more about his provision, provision and grace and love. Part of Jesus' teachings in the Bible, specifically in John, 14, uh, John 4 verse 14, sorry, Jesus points us directly to the importance of water as well. He says, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. The reason I linked sunlight and water is because Christ provides both the light and the living water. As I'm sure you're aware, um, in this specific instance in John 4, um, this, the story is um, when the woman comes to the well and um, Jesus asks, or she Jesus asks for water and she's like, why would I give you that? Um, and then he explains the importance of living water and never being thirsty again. Um, and in this case, the living water is in reference to the Holy Spirit and the guidance that we now have through the Holy Spirit from Christ. The living water becomes the clarity of understanding Christ's teachings and the provisions that he made for us. These two ingredients, sunlight and water, in plant growth are about sustenance and continually being refreshed by Christ. If we are trying to build our faith without the living water or the sun, we are going to fall hard and be discouraged in our journeys. We need to continually be sustained by Christ and his blessings, which is an important factor ensuring that our seeds of faith in our hearts are getting the right combination of sunlight and water. When helping others understand faith, it is important to make sure that they understand that God is very giving and wants only the best for us, providing everything that we need. There are so many Bible verses that um, back up this particular idea, um, but one of my favorites is the situation um, and the verse in Luke 12, 24 that says, consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Um, this gives me a lot of hope and joy because it just really reinforces the idea that Christ is giving and he wants to give to us and he wants to look after us. Um, so we need to ensure that we are tapped into the light and the flowing stream of Christ because that's all he wants for us, the best environment to grow and cultivate our seed of faith in our hearts. Um, so sunlight and water, um, I've labelled them as provisions and sustenance from Christ, um, and this is checkbox number two. So number three is weeding and getting rid of the bugs. Making sure the soil around a seed is not infected with weeds is super important to plant growth. As we read earlier in the parable of the four types of soil, soil that is contaminated with weeds quickly chokes out the seed. The weeds start taking away all the nutrients and water in the soil and they grow bigger than the other plants and start taking all the sunlight for themselves, which just starts the loop all over again where they're now, the weeds are now bigger than the plants and so they take more of the nutrients because they need more and it's just a spiral downhill. Um, and similarly, a garden that is infested with nasty bugs will eat away at the plants that are growing there, forcing them to break up and wither. In another parable that Jesus told not, longer, uh, not too long after the parable of the four types of soil, 
He tells his disciples that the weeds are the people of the evil one, found in Matthew 13, 38, part B. The parable is all about weeds, aptly named the parable of the weeds in my Bible. And in it, a man sows his wheat in the field. And, but at night time when the man is sleeping, um, the enemy comes along and sows seeds of weeds. Um, when Jesus later explains the parable to his disciples, he tells them that the enemy is the devil who is trying to destroy us. In our life, we need to make sure that we are not surrounding ourselves with people who are of bad influence on us. These people act like weeds, taking the nutrients from the soil, stealing all of the sunlight, just waiting for us to wither away in our faith. I also think that the nasty bugs can be likened to the sins that we hold on to as they eat away at us in our faith, um, making it shaky and unreliable. Like bugs in a garden, without proper treatment, sin will continue to come creeping back into our lives in small ways at first that are unnoticeable until it's too late and we have an infestation. In this way, it then becomes extremely important for us to make sure that we are continually checking our soil, our hearts, to make sure that our sins are not choking out our seeds of faith. We need to return to the good soil and turn it over, pulling out anything that looks like it might be damaging to our faith seed. When we are helping someone come to faith, we need to do this in such a way that we don't uproot the seed of faith as well that is growing in their hearts. It's easy to say, you can't do this, you mustn't do that, that's not very Christian-like. But there's a risk that by trying to pull out those weeds in a way that isn't loving, we are going to pull out their faith seed as well. Most of the time, this is not something that we can do alone. It's not easy for us to pull out our own weeds and get rid of our own bugs. Um, it requires a lot of hard work from the individual alongside Christ to come to the realisation that they, there are indeed weeds in their heart. Sometimes weeds can look like flowers, much like the dandelion. Um, the dandelion is a beautiful flower, but it's also classified as a weed. Um, and it's hard to understand sometimes why these weeds need to go if they look so beautiful. But if we truly want to let our faith blossom into what God wants it to be, we need to be prepared to start weeding and getting rid of the bugs. Um, so the third thing, weeding and getting rid of bugs, I likened that to removing sin and bad influences in our lives. And this is checkbox number three. The fourth and final aspect I've um, tried to identify is fertilizer. So fertilizer is used to increase the fertility of the soil and improve the growing conditions of any seed that is planted. It's often used to ensure that the crops being planted are gaining enough nutrients to allow the plants to grow more wholesome than they would be without fertilizer. I actually like to think of fertilizer in this way um, as the community of people we surround ourselves with, um, specifically like-minded Christians like a church. <laughs> um, we often start to take on the qualities and attributes of the people we are most often around. And in this way, they feed into us and our behaviours and actions. In relation to faith, alongside weeding out the bad influences, we need to replace those with good influences so that we can start acting according to the faith that we have. One major method of fertilisation for many, many years has been the use of salt, as it provides a lot of minerals back into the soil after the plants have taken all of the nutrients out. And the Bible has also used salt as an example of this fertilization. Um, can anyone guess where that might be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthew 5, yeah. Um, in Matthew 5, 13, part A, it says that you are the salt of the earth. Or in other words, you, me, us, we are the fertilizer of this world, helping to create an environment for faith to be tested and to continue to grow. If we are able to live our lives according to our faith, then by sharing that wisdom, we are helping to fertilize the seeds of faith other people have planted in their hearts. I actually think that community is really important for someone who has a faith um, not only for the shared nutrients, um, 
but also because of the accountability that others give us when we continue to broaden our faith and learn more about Christ's love and blessings. Even in the Bible, um, in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 10, part A, it says, two, two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. In faith, this is really important because as humans, we are bound to fall. But having someone there to help pick us back up and having a God who is willing to forgive us is one of the greatest saving graces that anyone could be offered. For our own seeds of faith, it is encouraging to have someone else who understands what we are going through and who can talk to us about our faith. Having a shared network of nutrients in a community of Christians is one of the blessings Christ has provided us. And for someone who is coming into faith, having the seed planted in their heart, being surrounded by a community of people who are willing to help grow their faith is so important because we were not intended to do it by ourselves, which is even evident from the beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve. So the fourth and final checkbox is fertilizer, and I've likened that to the community of Christians. Um, so that's checkbox number four. So when trying to help cultivate someone's faith, we need to be able to understand and remember each of these four aspects to help create an environment for faith to grow plentiful. If we try to grow plants without all four of these elements, we won't be able to fully cultivate the true potential of the seed. We won't be able to grow our seed of faith in our hearts. So a seed without good soil won't be able to take root and therefore never had the opportunity to grow in our hearts. We will never let our faith bloom and we will never have the opportunity to say that we truly had faith. A seed that doesn't get enough sunlight and water will take, will take root, but soon it will wither and die because of the lack of sustenance that the plant didn't get. In similarity to our faith, if we do not connect into Christ, if we do not get the living water and the sunlight from him, our faith will soon wither because we're not getting that sustenance and we will fall short. A seed that is constantly choked by weeds and eaten by bugs will grow, but it will be cut down. It will no longer have the opportunity to blossom because the weeds will choke out the, faith, uh, choke out the seed. Our faith will be destroyed by sins that are not forgiven and by the, uh, by the enemy deceiving us with the people who are coming into our lives being bad influences. However, I mean, additionally, a seed that is not treated with fertilizer will not gain any additional benefits from the soil. It will take up all of the nutrients in the soil, but then it will be left dry with nothing else. And... Um, our faith will not reap the benefits of a good community if we are not inserting ourselves into those situations, surrounding ourselves with like-minded people who will be able to feed into us and give us additional sustenance. And I'll admit, I also need to personally remember these for my own life. This is not so much a lesson or sermon to you. It is a sermon to me as well because we are all in this together. Um... I've definitely had moments in my life when I've been trying to cultivate my sin, but my heart has been like the path, or it's been rocky, or it's been full of weeds. Um, I've definitely hidden in the shadows, avoiding the sun, not drinking the living water that he provides because of the hurt that I've experienced in my life. I've also allowed weeds of sin to creep into my heart in moments of weakness, um, and after all of these things, I've definitely 100% avoided my accountability circle because I've been ashamed of the way I've been conducting my faith. But thankfully, we, me, you, we are given the opportunity to ask for forgiveness, to try again and give it another really good try. Like the man in my original illustration, Sometimes we try our best and don't understand why all of our hard work isn't making any fruitful gains. But we need to make sure that we are growing our seeds of faith in an optimal environment. Like the man in my illustration, we can also find a book that will help us learn more about growing our seed of faith. Can anyone guess what the book is? 
yeah, it's the Bible. <laughs> um, and we are very blessed to have been given this um, because we need to read this gardening book um, that helps us cultivate our faith seed um, and go out and find a greenhouse, changing our lifestyle and environment, moving our plants into the greenhouse so that they can be in an optimal environment for growth. When a seed of faith is planted in someone and each of these four aspects um, I have mentioned are coming into play, the good soil, which is the willing heart, sunlight and water, which is guidance from Christ, weeding and removing bugs, which is seeking forgiveness and changing our sinful ways, and fertilizer, which is surrounding ourselves with a community of like-minded Christians who can build up our faith, all brought together into a greenhouse lifestyle, I have no doubt that amazing things will blossom from this person. God wants us to grow our faith in the most optimal environment so that we can grow to be more like him and share the good news. Um, when I was talking to Pastor about it, uh, about my sermon the other week, he pointed me towards Ezekiel um, 36, 26. So if you would like to turn with me there. Ezekiel 36, 26. The verse says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will, will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Um, based on that verse alone, there is no doubt that God wants to be there to help us cultivate our hearts and be the gardener looking after the greenhouse. Um, I pray that all of us here are able to cultivate our hearts and continue to grow our faith in a greenhouse. <laughs>